Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm Matt Utendale, and uh, this morning I'm thrilled to have Mark Fairchild here, who ha for the past 12 years has been a director of the Munsell, Sci Munsell Color Science Laboratory at uh, the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, I met Mark through his HDR survey work, which he recently did. He, um, so we have a common interest in HDR photography, and he got to travel the country for uh, two semesters, it sounds like, and, and has a great collection of HDR images. So if anybody's in the need of high-res, high dynamic range images, definitely check out Mark's website. Um, it sounds like he's still out collecting HDR images. He got off the plane yesterday at 3.30 and headed straight to Mount Rainier to try to ca catch the... Uh, <laughs> The um, sunset there, unfortunately, the, the portable uh, kit. You're right. The the colors didn't uh, didn't work out for <laughs> last night, but uh, but I, I was impressed with his um, his drive to to go out and capture Mount Rainier last night. Anyway, with that, uh, please welcome Mark Fairchild. Thanks, Matt, and thanks for inviting me. It's we've only been here an hour, and it's been great already. So I'm I'm happy to. Uh, to get to visit the area. Um, I have an aunt that lives in Seattle who has been to my house a number of times and I haven't been to her house since I was 11 years old. So she's busy this week, so I can't even visit her. But I, I tried, so I get the brownie points. Um, and I had just been in Vancouver a couple months ago and I, I, I'm glad to get back, back out in this, this neck of the woods and have a chance to, to see Mount Rainier yesterday. So the, the talk I'm gonna give is a, a little bit of a collection of, of some of the research we've been doing lately um, on image perception in, in the color science lab back at RIT. And if any of you were at the CID conference in May, nobody's saying yes, perfect. Then I don't have to explain. Um, I actually gave this as an invited talk there, and it was a 20-minute talk. Well, it was supposed to be 15 minutes with five for questions. I used all 20. And I added only about two slides, and I'm sure I'll fill the hour. So you can, you can imagine what I did to try to fit it in, into 20 minutes. So I want to start with an image, which is always a good thing. And this isn't one of mine. I'll say that right away. I'm going to dim the lights for now. And then there's going to be a couple places I'm going to actually turn them off for some demos. So hopefully this is OK to keep everybody awake on a Monday morning. Um, it's Monday afternoon for me, so I have no issues at all. Uh, I think this came off of one of NASA's Image of the Day websites. Has anybody seen this image before? Good. Um, I like to show this to students and, and ask the students, um, how did the photographer, this is a single exposure. This isn't a high dynamic range image. So some of you know I work with high dynamic range images. There's all sorts of tricks there. This is a single exposure, basically normal straight photograph. How did the photographer get the setting sun and the lightning and the stars all in one exposure. Exactly. I knew there'd be clever people here, <laughs> better than my undergraduate students. They usually sit there and scratch their heads for a while. And it's not the sun, it's the moon. It's an overexposed moon setting. And the lightning went off during a time exposure, probably a couple of minutes, it looks like, from how far the stars moved. So the, the point is, that it's not always what you immediately assume that it is. And that's what a lot of image perception or color perception is. You like to look at the physics or the chemistry and think, ah, you know, I understand color. But it, it's more than meets the eye. Um, and this, you know, while it may look like a sunset right away, is actually a, a moonset. Nice overexposed moon. So what are these high dynamic range images? Well, if we look at the world, we have this huge range of luminous levels we might encounter. And this is in candles per square meter. You could pick your units from maybe, you know, what do I have there? Point triple zero one under starlight to over 10,000 under direct sunlight as far as scenes on, on the Earth. That's not necessarily looking straight at the sun. That's things illuminated directly by the sun. And, you know, there's however many, you know, people quote different numbers, but 10, 12, 14, 15 orders of magnitude of luminance in the, in the world that we encounter every day. Nice sunny day like today, we easily encounter. Go for a walk at lunchtime. Um, sit in your office and look out the window. 
from underneath your desk to out the window. There'll be you know, a huge range from, from down here somewhere to up here somewhere in, in one scene. And most imaging systems aren't designed to either capture or display that. They tend to display on the order of a couple hundred to one if it's a really good display. You'll see these, if you're shopping for TVs, you see these contrast ratios. A lot of those numbers are nonsense, but you know, they're talking about thousands to one now for, for these very high contrast displays, not millions to one. And then, and then um, on the capture end, there's probably a little bit more range that's captured in a good camera, but pretty much immediately, if it's a, say it's a point and shoot camera or a video camera or something like that, it's encoded down to a dynamic range of a couple hundred to one. You know, if it was 8 bits linear, it'd be 255 to 1 if it was a perfectly linear image. So not a huge range of capture or display, typically. An HDR image, we're trying to capture all of that. Essentially, on the capture end, we're trying to capture what's out there in the scene, faithfully. And then on the display end, since the displays are typically limited, prints are even more limited, by the way. Prints might be you know, 50 to 1, a good print, a really good print. Um, take that H high dynamic range information and render it onto the display in a, in, in my case, in a perceptually meaningful way so that it looks like what you saw when you were out there in the scene, that you're able to adapt to different regions of the scene. Let's make the image do that and display that, that perception. So that's a, what a lot of my research is about. The question I'm going to start with today, though, is if we had a display that could do it, and they're coming, I'll show you a couple of examples by the end of the talk, what would you do with it? And one of the things you can do with it is you can do some tricks with your color perception to make the, uh, make the display perform seemingly better than it's physically capable of. Perhaps to make the gamut bigger than is possible. And I'm going to bring the lights down a little bit here if I can take control again. <laughs> it's going to be a battle. Maybe not. <laughs> um, so, measuring color gamuts. Uh, a color gamut is essentially the boundary in lightness and chroma for a given display technology, the boundary of colors that you can make. And lightness and chroma describe our perceptions. So, uh, they're perceptual terms. They're talking about color appearance. They're not RGB values. They're not, you know, physical luminance or power per unit wavelength or anything like that. It's a description of our perceptions. And color scientists like me try to describe those perceptions. But essentially, for every hue around this circle, we have a boundary in the lightness dimension, which is coming out of the, uh, the um, screen here, and the chroma dimension, which is in the cylindrical coordinates going away from the origin. And there's a boundary. It makes a volume. It's very important that it's a boundary, or a volume. Gamuts are volumes, they're not areas. They're, they're three-dimensional things. And for a given display, there's this boundary, and we talk about color gamut. And this is, happens to be an example of an old CRT display and an old dye diffusion printer. It was an old Kodak printer with three dyes, cyan, magenta, and yellow. You can see there's some colors here that the display could make that the printer couldn't. And there's some the other way, too. It's not always one way. And that's a, an issue in color imaging called, that try, people try to resolve with what's called gamut mapping, is when I want to make this blue, I've made it on my monitor, it's gorgeous, I want to make a print, there's a big change in chroma in this case that I have to go through in order to print, and how do I do that well? I'm not going to talk about that stuff today. Um, Michael can talk about that if you want him to. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about the perception and, and how we manipulate that, and what these two percepts are, lightness and chroma. So lightness may seem somewhat obvious, but its definition is the brightness of an area judged relative to the brightness of a similarly illuminated area, illuminated area that appears to be white or highly transmitting. So first of all, it's a perception. Brightness is a perception. Lightness is a perception that's relative brightness. So brightness is what just changed in this room. <laughs> Perfect demo. And lightness would be if I had a reflecting object say my shirt, often I have a color checker in my hand, something like my shirt compared to my pants or the podium, when the lights go down in the room, the brightness of both of these objects goes down, 
but the lightness stays about the same because lightness is judged relative to something that looks white in similar illumination. So lightness is our perception about the object. The chairs are kind of dark gray. That's going to be true in this room, in the sunlight, in the dark. We're going to always eliminate that overall brightness and judge the object, which tends to be what we do most often is, is judge object color and eliminate the effects of the illumination. So that's lightness, our perception of relative brightness, light and dark. And chroma is our perception of relative colorfulness, how different the, the appearance of the object is from neutral or gray. So my little scale there is going from gray to, to red, getting higher and higher in chroma. So again, it's one of these, these uh, relative perceptions. And what I want to really point out here without getting into all the definitions is relative to an area that appears white. In both those definitions, which are written by really clever color scientists, and they're standardized, there's a dictionary of color and lighting terms you can go to, white is important. What is perceived as white is very important. And I say so, right there, importance of white. So both lightness and chroma are relative to an area that appears white. If you keep the stimulus constant, but you change what appears white, you can change lightness and chroma, right? Because you have the physical stimulus, you have the stimulus that appears white, and lightness and chroma are a judgment comparing the two. Well, if I keep the stimulus constant and change what appears white, I'm going to change lightness and chroma. There's two ways to change lightness and chroma. One is to change the stimulus, make it brighter or more saturated. One is to change the white. So I'm going to play around with the white a little bit today. And now I am going to actually have to have the lights all the way off. And I can push off and see if it sticks or happens. They're coming. There's a little temporal adaptation. Perfect. Thank you. So this is a little spot of light. And if I had a higher dynamic range projector, you wouldn't be able to see the shadow of my hand. This would be really dark. And that would be the only stimulus in the room. And you know, assume I didn't have exit lights and displays and all that. And if I brought you into this room, let you dark adapt, flipped on this light and it was the only thing in the room, I think you'd have no trouble saying that that was pretty much a white patch of light. In fact, it looks pretty convincing even with all the uh, flare and everything we have here. That, that's, that's a pretty good white. It's reasonable. You'll let me convince you of that anyway. Well, so that's white. What if I change what's perceived as white by adding something around it? So now, I didn't change this middle patch at all, but I put a brighter patch. This is higher brightness than that one. Now I've created lightness. We now have the perception of lightness because we have two things to judge. We can do the relative. So this one is now darker. It has a lower lightness than this one, which is now perceived as white. And just to you know, kind of prove I'm not cheating, didn't change physically. And there comes my white surround. Well, as you might imagine, I'm not going to stop there. So here's another one. Again, I'm not physically changing anything. And that's going to be consistent here. This one's now white. This one's gray. This one's darker gray. I've changed what's perceived as white. I've induced darkness or lower lightness into those two center patches. And I could do this all day. <laughs> Literally, if I had a high dynamic range display, I could pretty much do it all day and, and mess with your state of adaptation. I don't have enough dynamic range on this particular display to make that center look black, but I could if I, if I did have a higher dynamic range display. Back in my lab, I have two, actually three slide projectors superimposed. So I can really turn one down and, you know, it's all analog and have huge dynamic range. And I can make white look black. But I can get pretty close here. So again, that, that patch, yeah, it's just too good. I have to go back. Whoops. I don't know what I got caught in a loop here. I'll, I'll keep going forward. So there's another one. And one more. And that's it. I'm, I'll stop there. But uh, um, large range, when you're pretty much dark adapted, this looks white. As I increase what looks white, those are induced to look gray. So that's changing the perception of lightness. It also works in chroma. So here's an orange patch. And the definition of brown 
I do a whole lecture on brown, is uh, a dark, which means low lightness, low chroma, orange hue. This is a patch of light that's an orange hue. To make it brown, I have to lower its lightness and lower its chroma. Well, the best way to lower lightness and chroma is to introduce something brighter around it that's perceived as white. And I didn't quite get to a dark brown here because I don't have as much dynamic range. But that, again, is physically the same as that one. And you can see it gets browner. And again, if I had more range, I could actually make, actually, if I knew this spot would be so bright, I could have made it darker to start with. And if I make a gray, it's somewhere in between. So again, changing what's perceived as white changes both lightness and chroma. It's part of the definition. It's not just the definition. It is our perceptions. It's the way the visual system works. So when we want to look at color gamuts, we can have the lights back up for a few minutes now. Um, when we look at color gamuts, we don't need, we can't just look at the physics of a display and draw a triangle and say that's the color gamut. Color is a perception. I actually call those chromaticity gamuts because they are the gamuts of chromaticity coordinates that you can make on a display. A color gamut, you need to know how you're perceiving things. You need to know what appears white. So you can do good things with that. You can also do bad things. And maybe some of you have seen these uh, data projectors, that, particularly the DLP ones. I love DLP, so don't, don't take that the wrong way. But there's DLP projectors that have a fourth channel that's white. So they have red, green, blue, and white. Sometimes they have other channels for other reasons, but essentially they have four. And the reason they add in the white is because the, the low-end DLPs are sequential displays. So they have a red, a green, a blue on in sequence. And compared to, say, a cheap LCD projector, which has three LCDs that are superimposing on each other, it's hard to get the same brightness because you're only ever showing a third of the light. So they put on a, a fourth channel that's white in order to get more brightness. So they show you know, essentially a, a quarter red, a quarter green, a quarter blue, and a quarter white. And then, and then they can put their ANSI lumens on the side of the box as much higher. Well, the problem is I made things look darker and less colorful by introducing a brighter white. So if you add that fourth white channel, you're making your display look darker and less colorful, even though your ANSI lumens, you know, the luminance of the display is higher. You've actually destroyed the, the color quality of the display. And what's kind of interesting about that is because in general, Colorfulness and brightness increase with more light. That's just perception. You know, when, when this room is illuminated, everything in here looks brighter and more colorful because there's more light. That's a perceptual effect. We're not linear. Otherwise, everything would always look the same. It'd be really boring. And we wouldn't need high dynamic range images. Um, so in general, you think, ah, I get a brighter display. It's going to be more colorful. But these displays are brighter and less colorful because of that fourth channel. So Rod Heckman's one of my grad students. And we actually did some, some psychophysics on this where we measured these in a color appearance space. And these plots are showing lightness and chroma, something that correlates with that perception, accounting for what actually looks white in the scene, for two modes in, a, in one particular display. Photo mode, which works like a normal RGB projector. Red plus green plus blue equals white. There's no fourth white channel. And presentation mode, which is apparently when people are using PowerPoint and have a white background, it looks great and overcomes all this extra light in the room. And what you see is here's the lightness chroma gamut. There's more lightness up here. Well, they're normalized because you adapt to the white. I was thinking I had a brightness plot. I don't have that in the stock. They're normalized to 100 here because the maximum always looks white. And here's the presentation mode. Because that's got added white, it made all the colors darker. So here's, here's the primary. I think this is a red slice down here. Whereas in the photo mode, where this is actually physically darker, it looks the same lightness. And you have all this extra color gamut. And this is a a red, green, yellow, blue. So this is kind of a chromaticity gamut. And the photo mode is much larger than the presentation mode. And we actually did visual experiments on that. And what we measure in the appearance model is what people see. And I, I have a plot I'll show in, the, in a minute. So this is just a little pet peeve first. This is what you see as gamuts of displays, is these, these little triangles in chromaticity diagrams. I call them chromaticity di gamuts because they don't tell you about color, which may shock a lot of you to hear from me. They tell you where the primaries lie. And additive mixtures of primaries fall inside the triangle because additive mixtures on this particular diagram lie on a straight line. So if this red mixes, or, sorry, this red mixes with this blue, it's on a straight line. That green, you can make everything in the triangle. You don't know anything about whether it's light or dark because there's no luminance information here. You don't know anything about what it looks like because you don't know what your visual system's adapted to. You need all that extra information to get color. So there's a lot of sort of specsmanship with these things. 
and you might see a display that has a huge triangle and you put it next to a display with a little triangle that's brighter, the one with a little triangle and more luminance is going to look more colorful. And we've done experiments on that as well. So these things, bad. There's, if you want to talk about appearance, I'll even put an X through it. That's how bad it is. <laughs> Sometimes we tear them up. The printed ones are really bad because people think that the colors printed actually match the coordinates. And if you ever tried to print something accurately, you, you know that's, that's not easy. So appearance gamuts, we use typically a model called CCAM02. That's a standard model, which stands for the CIE Color Appearance Model 2002. The dates are in these models because people recognize it, and we might come up with something better. So in that model, you can, you can look at lightness chroma and hue, as I've been describing. You can look at brightness colorfulness hue, which keeps sort of the absolute perception in there. You can do all that stuff. And it worked well in that experiment that I mentioned. So here is perceived, we did the psychophysics. We actually filled a, a lecture hall with people and had them scale brightness and colorfulness on little answer sheets as we showed them displays. It was the most efficient experiment we've ever done because we had a whole room of observers at once. And we have the ratio plotted here. So this is a big summary of the data. So the ratio of photographic to presentation mode, and this is colorfulness. We did it on brightness and other dimensions as well. So generally the ratio is above one because photographic mode looks better, more colorful. It depends on content. We had a, a portrait of a woman on a white background. She was all down in that low part anyway. So it really didn't change much. So Can you define photographic versus presentation? That's the mode of the projector. The photographic mode was R plus G plus B equals white. Okay. So it worked like a traditional additive display. The presentation mode had the fourth white channel. Okay. So that was just a setting on the projector. The, the name of the setting. Yeah, the exactly, exactly. There's no technical meaning to that. Photo mode is because everybody would look at their photos in the four channels and say, wow, they're horrible. And then you'd go in and say, ah, oh, there's a photo mode. Now they look better. Um, some of them now have an sRGB mode, which they still put in a little bit of white, but a lot less. So they, they tone them down, at least the one that we have. I can't vouch for everybody. So this, this is the range of visual data of the scaling. So the woman, woman image was right around one because that looked pretty much the same in both. And then the dots are the predicted colorfulness range ratio from CCAM02. And the dots all fall in the, the error bars of the visual data. And we didn't have to do anything else. You just, just calculated it. So that's, that's a neat result. All right. We are cutting off the top here. But that's all right. We won't miss anything important. Um, so if you can make the gamuts look smaller, can you make them look bigger? And of course, yeah, why not? So if you make the white brighter and leave the primaries alone, the perceived gamut goes down. If you make the bright, the, I'm sorry, if you make the white dimmer, leave the primaries alone, the perceived gamut actually gets bigger. And again, there's some papers we've published. This has gotten a lot of attention from the display business, as you might imagine. You can say, ah, oh, you don't have to do anything, and you can make your gamuts bigger. They like that. So that's one of the reasons they had me out at CID to talk, and it's been published in CRNA and the CID journal. So what we did, first computationally, is change what we call the diffuse white point. If, you, if you're really into digital video or anything like that, Let's say you have a 0 to 255 range. 255 is not used to encode white. I forget the number that's used. 230, somebody may. 235? Okay, thanks. So 235 is usually what we call a diffuse white, like a piece of paper. And you leave some <coughs> values above for highlights and light sources and things. So that's a well-known process in, in imaging. Photo CD did that back when, when Kodak did that. Film did that. Film had the you know, transparencies didn't put diffuse white if it was properly exposed at the minimum density of the transparency. They left some headroom for more dynamic range. So that's what we're playing with, is really where that's set. So if we push that point down relative to the primary maxima, in other words, don't change the primaries of display, but reserve some white, what is the effect on the appearance gamut? And that's what that paper is all about. And here's some quick results. This is again in CTM02, lightness chroma gamuts. And you're going to have to kind of trust me on the explanation. But essentially, the red contour, so this is lightness, and then that's a red-green dimension. This is red-green versus yellow-blue. The red contour is essentially the spectrum locus on a chromaticity diagram. It's more than that because it has a lightness dimension. It's the macadam limits, if you're familiar with those. So it's the range of all physically realizable colors. 
it's what most you know display engineers would say. That's the ultimate, right? If you can make all those colors, you've you've got you've got it made. You're making everything physically realizable. And I think on the slide, yeah. So our our title, which is you know, that's, titles are always important. Expanding display color, color gamut beyond the spectrum locus. That's catchy, right? Because a display guy reads that and says, huh, you know, what kind of light source did they invent? You can't do that. There's there's a physical limitation there, but perceptually you can. So here's that boundary in appearance space, and you're going to have to forgive our kind of strange nomenclature here. Imagine our display is linear, and 8 bits means that white's at 255, and all the colors are below that. Diffuse white's at 255, there's nothing above. 9 bits means we have a range of 0 to 512. We've got an extra bit, but we leave white at 255. So we've doubled the range of the display, but we don't use it for white. We just use it for the primaries. 10 bits means that again. So essentially at 10 bits, white is at a quarter of the capability of our display, yet the primaries can go the full way. So we're, we're really holding back on white. So it's, it's a big change. But if we go to a 11 bits, so not a quarter but an eighth, we can actually make perceptions that are outside the spectrum locus. And that is possible to have those perceptions. So, you know, perceptions aren't limited by physics. Keep that in mind. Um, sometimes there's perceptions that are predicted that aren't possible, too. Um, a really neat way to do it, I learned this from a student at Cornell when I was doing a sabbatical there. She liked to lay out in the grass and lay on her back, close her eyes, and look at the sun with her eyes closed. So the sun's going through her eyelids, which is all the blood vessels. You're exposed to this incredibly red stimulus. And she'd do it for like 20 or 30 minutes. And then you're adapting to red. So you're becoming very desensitized to red. And then she'd quickly open her eyes and look at the green grass. And she'd say, it's the most amazing green you've ever seen. You know, I guess you didn't need any drugs, right? You just <laughs> lay there for a while. And if you do that, I'm going to show you some demos like that that are very quick. It's really amazing. And that's kind of perceiving things outside the spectrum locus. Um, so 11 bits, you can do it. You can do it. Now, I'm not going to take this projector and do that. Because I'd have, I'd be using, I can't do the calculation in my head, you know, 25 digital counts or whatever for my full range of the image and, and leaving everything else alone. It wouldn't be a very good image. But if I had a high dynamic range display, I could do it with more bits and more range. And that's exactly what we want to do with a high dynamic range display. So I'm going to need the lights all the way off again. I'll try pushing here. Because this demo won't work if there's any light. So here's the same gamuts in brightness and colorfulness. Essentially the same result. We assumed our display had a 100 to 1 dynamic range, which is pretty realistic. Um, so that's why it doesn't go down to a perfect zero, whereas the mechanical limits do go to a perfect zero. Um, same, same answer in brightness and colorfulness. Now, you're going to have to forgive me for shortcutting my demo. I have a, another talk on this, just on this, that I take 20 minutes of the talk to adapt people to the dark gradually so they don't know what's going on. I'm going to do it to you much more quickly like in about three seconds. So, summarizing that result, 11 bits in our linear encoding. I had somebody send me an email, why on earth would you encode video linearly? And I was like, no, 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 that's not it. We just use that as a shorthand of how many times you have to multiply the, the white or divide it. If you have 11 bits linear and eight bits of them are below the diffuse white, three bits above, you can exceed the spectrum locus. And then if you want to do nonlinear encoding, you can save bits, of course. So if you have your diffuse weight at 100 candelas per square meter, which is a, a, a good display historically, it's kind of dim these days, your max would have to be 800, eight times that. So let me show some images. And these are images from my high dynamic range survey that Matt mentioned. So I'll talk about that a little more in a couple minutes. Um, this is a sunrise at Bar Harbor. I managed somehow to to wake up out of my stupor before the sun came up and see that the clouds were pink. And we, we had rented a house right in the village there, so I didn't have to stumble too far to get the sunrise. And it was actually pretty cool with the ships there. And there's a nice old inn here. And that's a uh, somewhat visual rendering that I did manually. So that's, I'd say that's pretty much what it looked like, as good as displays are. Here's another image from the survey. This is in Oklahoma after driving through the most harrowing thunderstorm I've ever seen. And I like thunderstorms. Um, this was last spring when there was a bunch of tornadoes in Kansas killing people. 
well, there's a front in Oklahoma sitting there for days with these thunderstorms. And I was driving east, and there was no waiting it out because it wasn't moving. And I had to drive faster than it was moving. So it was like driving through a hurricane. I got through the one totally black storm with hail and, you know, barely could see anything. I'm going like 20 miles an hour. The trucks don't slow down. So they're still blasting by you. And then it cleared up. I'm like, oh, I'm done. But that was like the eye of the storm, and I had to do it all again. And then I wanted to stop at the Route 66 Museum. So the storm's behind me over there, and everything's wet, and I didn't want to stay very long, but I shot an image with the neon lights, which is kind of cool. And this is hard to do. It was really dark. So this was kind of like late twilight, the neon glowing. It didn't render too well, but in a good rendering of this, you can actually see the neon tubes and everything, which is a hard thing to photograph. And uh, those are just images. Those are, I'm showing to you normally, just rendered as 8-bit images. Now I'm going to show you what would happen if I use only a quarter of the dynamic range of the display. I'm not going all the way to 8 for white and let the primaries go bigger. So there's the normal image. Here's our exceeding the spectrum locus. Well, not quite, but approaching that image. So what I did to you is the last few slides I've been dimming the display so that the white up there, and I purposely left a white, is only using a quarter of the, the digital counts. So there's some nonlinearities. Forgive me for that. And then I picked a point. I think I picked the white of the ship here to be my diffuse white. And I used that as the maximum rather than the full image and let the, the primaries go. So you get a much more vivid experience and much more realistic. And I didn't do anything to the display. I didn't do any manipulation other than reserving what I use for, for white. And here's my uh, Route 66 museum. And now look at those neon lights. They look kind of like neon lights now, don't they? And they're on the spectrum locus, physically. You know, that neon red is right out there. So to me, this is a real striking demonstration. This is a lot more what it looked like. You know, imagine really dark. There's some rain on the thing, and that light's glowing. You can see the, some of the lights, the, the street lights in the back were still on. That's how dark it was after the storm even though it was about noon. Um, yes, sorry. It's a very simple-minded explanation of what you're doing is taking the color cube and squishing the sort of white point down. Mm -hmm. so that I'm squishing the white point down and leaving the red, green, and blue points where they are. Taking the things that are less chroma and lowering their lightness. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm taking everything and lowering its lightness except things that would have a signal above that 255. Remember, this was a high dynamic range image to start with. You can't just take a low dynamic range image and do that. You have to have the information to start with. So that's the key. And I have one more example. This was up in the Adirondacks in, in autumn. And the sun was actually coming through this tree towards my camera, which is, it looks pretty nice there. But those leaves were really glowing, and that's what happens if you fill the, the gamut up. So all I did was push your display, the display down. And you imagine when I did this talk as a full talk on this topic and every slide was just a teeny bit darker. Nobody noticed and then these popped up and everybody's like, whoa. So it can be done. And you'll see how bright it gets the next slide. So there's the transition I did on the white point. Look at the text up there. Whoops, to that. So now we're, we're back up. We can have the lights back up now. So the practicality of that is you need a high dynamic range display. You need more bits. You need more dynamic range to play with in order to really implement that. But they're becoming available. At the SID meeting, pretty much everybody had a, an LCD with dimmable backlights, locally dimming backlights. So at different regions behind the LCD panel, if it's a dark region, they don't turn the backlight on as much. If it's a bright region, they turn it on more. Um, Dolby, which was formerly Brightside, which is formerly uh, Sunnybrook up in Vancouver. Um, they, they will have products coming out. That's been announced for you know, high-end sort of digital cinema proofing applications. There's a TV coming out. One of those was at SID, if you're into like $30,000 televisions. Beautiful wood cabinets, gorgeous TV. And it has these LED backlights that are locally dimming. Samsung has a product out that does a little bit of it already. Um, and, they, and there's also globally dimming TVs where the backlight goes down for dark scenes and up for bright scenes, and it saves a tremendous amount of energy. That was a big thing at SID this year, is how much energy you can save by dimming the backlights. 
Um, and you have to encode the images for that as well. You can't just take the image and throw it up there. You have to say what's diffuse white. So we, we build these things too. Um, kind of like Sunnybrook did in, in the original prototypes. This is, this is our version zero. We're quickly working on version one back home right now this summer. But essentially what we do is take a DLP projector, project it onto the back of a LCD display. And you'll notice these are not high-end components. These are 15-inch Apple displays that we can get on eBay for 100 bucks or something like that, because my students really like to break them. So you know, I don't know how many he went through to get that, but we peel away the back, take out the backlight, project this on, put a Fresnel lens and a diffuser in there, a little bit of optical tricks. And essentially, we're, we're modulating the image twice, once with a projector, once with a LCD filter. We get huge dynamic ranges. At one point, he added up to 350,000 to one and 3,500 candelas for the luminance. Very bright, high dynamic range. Right now we're building one with a 30-inch Apple Cinema display as the front end, and six DLP projectors as the back end, each projecting one-sixth of it. We were gonna buy you know, a big, huge cinema projector for like $50,000, and we realized, well, that luminance is equivalent to six of these little ones we can get for $1,000 each. And saner minds prevailed, and we're going with the six. So uh, we've studied perception. This is actually, just quickly, a picture of the HDR display here. This is uh, not, a, not the greatest photography. We were doing a, an open house at RIT, so I snapped this really quick. This is the HDR display with a normal 15-inch LCD next to it. And it was in a little auto exposure. This is black on the LCD. And the exposure is high because the room was dark. So this is white and black. And this is white and black on the HDR display. So you get an idea that. You know, this would have looked black if you were sitting there. It would have looked like a bad black, like you see on, you know, however many five, six, years, seven year old LCDs, but it's a huge difference. And we've been studying perception. We build scenes, render them, have people choose which they like. I'm going to run out of time, so I, <laughs> I'll go through this a little quickly. Here's some of the, the scenes. These are all built in the lab. So I was actually going over this one with, with Matt before the talk, and we did a good job because he thought this was actually a window in our lab. And apparently we zoomed in, we think it's Sydney, Australia. I wish that was where the lab was sitting, but if you go out the wall of our lab, you see a parking lot and a brick wall, so not quite as exciting. So we built these different displays. This is one I calibrated my camera with. And then looking at different algorithms. I don't have time to go through the various algorithms that are used for, for rendering these. iCam is one that we developed. ICAM 06 is the one the student doing this work developed, a revised version. Um, this is Photoshop Global and Photoshop Local, kind of manually tuning them to make good images. And this set of um, data is visual accuracy. So they saw the scene, they adapted to it, kind of remembered it, go to the display, adapt for say a minute or two, and say which looks more like what you just saw a couple minutes ago. So it's accuracy, not preference. And he rendered these for accuracy. So He's saying, oh, look, Mark, mine works better than yours. But, uh, you know, maybe it did. So accuracy is one thing. Preference is another. If you ask people which is a prettier image, you might not get the same answer. We've done those experiments as well. And one of the things we did with this that we published last year was comparing the real scenes with uh, the display. Can we use the display to simulate the real scenes? And we get similar scaling results. So that's a, and other people have done this sort of experiment which is good because then we don't have to build all these scenes in the lab. We can actually simulate the world on the display. That's why we're building a bigger one. 15 inches isn't a very good simulation of the world. 30 inches is better. We hope to have 40 with three of them at some point to kind of surround you in high dynamic range. So this is uh, the way we do the tone mapping right now, this iCam 06. It's all out on our web page if you want to download it and play with it. But it's, it's a combination of Excuse me, what we had done earlier with the ICAM model, which stands for Image Color Appearance Model, where we have some local adaptation and different spatial processing with uh, Durand and Dorsey's bilateral model. So we added a bilateral filtering step essentially to ICAM and, uh, and uh, a couple other little things. So essentially the image gets separated into a base layer and a detail layer, and then we have a blurry version of the image that we call our white. So in the context of this talk, that's what you're adapting to. You adapt locally to that white image. That's applied to the base layer, um, which gives you local adaptation, which really compresses the range. Then we add 
the details layer back in. And there's a little bit, this is the part I don't like. This is a little bit um, ad hoc adjusting the colorfulness. There is some theory behind it. The surround, there's definitely theory that the surround of a display changes its perceived contrast. And then we invert it and we get back to a, an image that we can look at on a given display. So here's a couple of examples. Um, if we could have the lights down a little bit, actually for the next several uh, slides. Um, again, these are some of my images. This is the Bar Harbor one again. These are rendered for average dim and dark surrounds. So that's showing the surround effect. In a dark surround, you have to enhance the contrast because the darkness perceptually decreases contrast. When you're in a dark room, dark things look lighter. So that's what movies are done. They're rendered at higher gamma, higher contrast to offset the fact that you're sitting in the dark. And this is a little shot at the Hancock Shaker Village in Massachusetts. There's a barn out here that you can see through the window. There's no lights or very few lights inside a Shaker building, a, a traditional one. So there was one 60 watt bulb kind of dangling from the ceiling behind me. So this was essentially in the dark and you can get an idea of the, the rendering. So let me talk about the uh, survey for a couple minutes. These are my maps, my map of my, my journeys. I think I mentioned them. So I live here, in case you don't know where, where Rochester is. It's much more like the Midwest than it is like the city that's over here. So it's a wonderful place to live. Um, and the main trip, of course, was taking off through the north. There are a few highlights I wanted to hit. There's a statue of Paul Bunyan in Bemidji, Minnesota that I just had to have an image of, for example. Um, so you can kind of pick out some key places. Yosemite's on there. Have a good friend that lives in LA. I had to go golfing with him. If you're into golf, Band and Dunes is right here. I had to go there. So uh, some key places. And essentially what I did, for most of the scenes, I captured nine exposures, each separated by one stop. So that title says nine stop mosaic. So this is Golden Gate Bridge, about a half an hour after sunset, and essentially underexposed by four stops, what would be a typical exposure if you just sat there and took one, and overexposed by four stops. Now you can see the, the flowers in the foreground and everything. And those are then combined into one linear file that says linear open EXR on top. There's some quantization because it's really an 8-bit JPEG now. But uh, that would be sort of a linear rendering, a single exposure, if you will, where I tried to preserve the light sources to a degree. I didn't blow out the highlights, so I lost the shadows. And then if I do local rendering using one of these visual models where you adapt differently to different regions, I get an image that looks like this. So I, I kind of say it's like turning on the lights. And that's what your visual system is doing. When you look down here, you adapt to this region, you can see that. And this is exactly the sort of thing that, that Matt's working on, which is why I'm standing here today. Um, and, but yet you keep the colorfulness of, of the bridge. The lights aren't blown away. You can see the city in the background. Um, you know, the, the waves and everything are blurred away because this was nine exposures after dark. So the longest exposure, if I remember right, was maybe a minute. You know, this is really after dark. So it was, you know, maybe from like, a thirtieth of a second up to a minute where the nine exposures or something like that. Okay. Yes, absolutely. How do you, uh, change the exposure on your camera? Because the normal camera has the three stop bracket mode. This is a really nice camera. It's a Nikon D2X that has nine stop auto bracketing. That's one of the reasons I picked that camera. So I can hold the button down once and get nine stops. And that's, well, that's really rare. That's the only camera I know of that has nine that can be separated by a stop as far as a production camera. Yeah. Use a remote shutter release. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can do it. I have another, the little one I have with me now doesn't even have auto bracketing. It's a new Nikon and they took that feature off for some reason. And I do it, I change it manually and use the remote control. So, yeah. Well, after sunset, yeah. I mean, do, do, is, it, is the sky perceptually how you want it to be? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it's a half hour after sunset. Okay. So the sky still was very blue. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. After dark, after sunset is what I should have said. Um, so there's a website. If you just search for the HDR survey, you'll, you'll find it or ask me or ask Matt. I can point you at it. But there's about 100 of these images with visual scaling data, color metric data, all free, available for research. That was the whole purpose. There's the thumbnails of all the images so you can trace my trips. 
But there's things like neon lights in Las Vegas, Yosemite. This is the lodge at Yosemite on the inside, so it's internal, external. The Waffle House, you gotta eat. Um, some of the lab scenes, we have some self-portraits. That's one of my grad students. There's me with my Luxo lamp. There's Paul Bunyan. So there's a wide range of images. We tried to make a variety, we tried to make them pretty so when people do these visual experiments, they don't get bored. I think I have just a couple more. So this is at Acadia National Park up in Maine, a place called Otter Point. And I put the sun right in the corner of the exposure so that the flare from the sun would be in the other corner and not ruin the whole image. Um, you know, lens flare is an issue when you start doing this. Here's the linear open EXR. If I don't blow away the sun too much, then the rest of the image is black because the sun's really bright. And here's the rendered one. And I think that's pretty faithful even on this display that when I was sitting there on the edge of the cliff, I could look at the green stuff and see it. You know, the sun's beaten down on it. It looked fairly colorful. The sky was blue. It was really bright over there. I could look into these highlights. You can imagine an ocean scene with the sun out there. You can look at those. You can't look at the sun. It's going to get blown away. So then, of course, there's different ways to render them. This is when I did it interactively in Adobe Photoshop CS2. This is my student's iCamo 2, which I think is a little too saturated and too colorful. But yet, in that accuracy experiment, it came out the best. So, you know, I'm one observer. That's well, we didn't on this one, not on this experiment. No, oh, or not on this image. Right, the algorithm. So this may be bad for this image. That's a good point. Yeah, I didn't sit there. I, actually, we're going back to Maine this summer. <laughs> if we can get some funding for that. I need to move the lab to Bar Harbor for a week. So here's again at the Shaker Village. So here's that lamp I was talking about. This is looking into that kitchen sink scene. And you know, this one might be more accurate for this particular image. The bricks are kind of too reddish there, but there's more contrast here too, and that comes from some of the uh, the bilateral filtering. It enhances the edges. Your CS2 local, you said that was manual. Well, it's yeah. I, I set the white and black point manually, which you have to do to get a decent image. And I think I did a little uh, tone correction at the end, so a little gamma correction. So it was there. I can't remember if the settings were the default, but one set of settings for the local, and then you get an image that's really compressed, and you have to set the white and black. And I did that manually. So, a couple more minutes. I'm going to change, change gears here. Um, there's other aspects about color perception besides these sort of overall appearance things. And one of them is the fact that we all have different color responses in our visual system. We call that observer metamorphism. Here I have it labeled observer variability. So this comes from a, a fairly recent CIE recommendation on how to calculate cone responses for people of different ages on average. So an average 20-year-old versus an average 80-year-old. As we age, our lens becomes yellower and yellower. So those functions all get pushed over towards the longer wavelengths. And also for different field sizes. So there's a way to calculate this. This is actually the model. Um, I don't really have time to go through it, but they have the absorptivity of the three cones. They have the transmittance of the macula, which is a protective filter. Um, Transmittance of the ocular media, media, the lens, the cornea, the goo in between. And all of that goes in. Those are all functions of age, of field size, of both. They give you the, the average cone responses. So here again, I guess that's just what I showed you. That's how you get the, the functions. But what's interesting in a practical sense is what impact does this have on displays? So again, I did a little computational experiment. So my original colors were a Macbeth color checker under D65. This is all computational, so this is just an icon. So I took the reflectances, I took the Illuminate D65 spectral power distribution. I took one of those standard observers for a given field size and a given age, and I computed a match on a display. So I'm thinking of cinema here. So one of the displays had broadband primaries, so it had a smaller color gamut. Broadband means a, a wide range of, of wavelengths. I'll show you the spectra in a, in a minute. The other one is narrowband, so think like a laser display. Red, green, and blue monochromatic light. Calculate the match. Different field sizes, different ages. So we're, essentially we're having a bunch of different people match the original scene to the display. But I'm doing it computationally. Then I had the CIE 1931 standard observer evaluate that match. So I picked one observer as kind of the judge. 
And that observer, the normal two degree observer said, how different are these two to me? So now you see I changed them. They matched before, they don't match now, if you didn't catch that. This one's pinker, this one's greener. Because that standard observer is a different observer. And it's saying, okay, for a 20 year old with a one degree field size, that's a match, but for me, that one's pink, that one's green. And people are actually seeing this. The, the digital cinema folks are looking at different display technologies. They'll do crazy things, like have half a display with one set of primaries and the other half with another, and then they'll get their color emitters out and make a match, and then they'll sit there and argue about, well, it's pink, it's green. Because it is to each of the individuals. They're highly metameric matches. And if you have monochromatic primaries, just three wavelengths, there's any difference in the observers at those three wavelengths, all bets are off on the match. So here's what the, the spectra looked like. Pick three wavelengths, pick three good ones, and then three Gaussians. This is a log scale, so the three Gaussians added together. This is when both displays are making white. So one of them has no energy anywhere but these three wavelengths, the other one has energy everywhere. And here are those evil chromaticity, chromaticity gamuts, where everybody in the display business would say that laser one has a huge gamut, the other one has a small gamut. You know, shame on you. But again, if, if I change the brightness and so on, all bets are off on that. Just give you an idea where they plot. And here are the average differences, averaged across those 24 patches on the color checker. So this is a 32-year-old observer with different field sizes in the computation, so different observers. And this is C lab delta E, if you're familiar. Somewhere around one is just noticeable. Somewhere, it's very much a rule of thumb. The two degree observer pretty much agrees with the two degree observer from the new CIE proposal. That makes sense, it's fairly accurate. So those are very low. You get out to the 10 degree field size, you got differences on average of eight, 10, and so on. Very big differences. For the narrow band display, not so big for the broadband. The inter-observer differences are bigger for a narrow band display. That's something that people making these plays need to think about. They're gonna look less consistent to people because of pushing those gamuts out. And they may not be making a bigger gamut anyway. Here's the same thing for 10 degree observer at different ages. Again, way up here. Essentially more than a factor of two larger differences for the narrow band display. And I don't know if this will show up, but uh, these are four different observers matching that spot in the middle. And you shouldn't be concerned so much with how well this matches, but look at how different the four are. Because there's a transformation for a different observer anyway. But these kind of differences are very realistic for different people looking at the same display. And in terms of a photograph, there's my little girl looking out the window. Question? And you can see the, the range there. Yes? When you talk about field of view, that's mm -hmm. like how close you're sitting to the screen? So yeah, well, in these experiments, it's how close you're sitting to the little, two little color patches that you're matching. Okay. So in, in a real display, it's a more complicated thing. But yeah, it would be the, the, the angular subtense of the display. For this stuff, it's always two little color patches, ranging from one degree, which is about my thumb, to 10, which is you know, two hands side by side. All right, I'm gonna end with a couple of demos here that are really cool, so you'll forgive me for going over. I hope. I came a long ways. So I'm turning the lights off again. So let's look at adaptation because that's where we started, that's where we'll, we'll finish. This is a classic demo that I know some of you have seen because you've seen it from me before. But this is due to Bob Hunt who wrote the book, The Reproduction of Color, and quite literally wrote the book on color reproduction. So this is a, a nice, beautiful bowl of fruit, one of those standard images people use. And I'm going to take a computational cyan filter. Here's my cyan filter. So imagine I actually had a cyan filter and I was projecting white and I held it up in front of the, the screen, I'd get something like this. So kind of a light cyan filter. And it would have to have cyan filter written on it. But I'm gonna take that filter and I'm gonna put it just in front of the banana. So here's a, a quiz on subtractive color mixing. Yellow banana, I put a cyan filter in front of it. There's yellow light there, the cyan removes red. So the cyan filter with the yellow banana is gonna leave you with Green, very good. So cyan filter over the banana, and lo and behold, there's a green banana. It's a light cyan filter, so it's a light green. And now, instead of just putting that cyan filter over the green banana, I'm gonna put it over the entire image. So what color should the banana be? 
You guys are good. It's green, come on. Haven't you been listening to everything? It's yellow, yeah. Physically, it's the same chromaticity. So if I flip back and forth, if I got out my colorimeter, that banana's not changing. But it looks yellow, yeah, because your adaptation state has been pushed towards the cyan. So it takes away that greenness, and it does it very quickly and very convincingly. So that's chromatic adaptation. Now I'm going to show it to you a different way. So there's my girls again. It's funny, I gave this talk, and uh, some of you may know Joyce Farrell. Um, she was there, and she's like, wow, Mark, I hadn't seen your girls in so long. They're so old. And it's really funny because this picture is five years old. This one looks like this one now. <laughs> the other one's, you know, a teenager. So it's just funny. I'm like, yeah, Joyce, they've grown up a lot. <laughs> um, but uh, here they are visiting Mickey Mouse. Those two images are the same. What I'm going to do is adapt you to different things and have you look at these images. And, and then I will, I will quit, I promise. So now I'm going to do chromatic adaptation, just like I did before, only with a different stimulus. So what I want you to do for these demos is you don't need to fixate in a single point, but you need to keep your gaze in these little yellow ellipses. So I want you to, to look at the yellow ellipse. You can fixate if you want, but you don't need to. You just need the, to stay in that region. And what's happening is, excuse me, on the right side of your visual field, you're adapting to the yellow illumination or the yellow image. So you're becoming less sensitive to yellow. On the left side, you're adapting to the blue, you're becoming less sensitive to the blue. Adapting is just like getting tired of something. You know, in, in Rochester, winter comes, it's really cold. But by spring, the first day when it's above 20 degrees, all the kids are out in their bikinis playing frisbee because they've adapted to the cold. So now I'm going to go back to those two images that are the same, and I want you to notice what color you see. So you see this one is very bluish, and that one is yellowish. That's an after image. After images are adaptation because you've adapted the retina. So that's cool. That's, that's what I do all the time. Yes, Steve. Just a slight comment on that. I see that color difference when I'm looking in the middle. Yes. If I'm, if I'm, fix, if I'm aiming my gaze elsewhere, I don't really see the difference. Right, so you right. See it really is. Oh, yeah, right. yeah, because it moves with your retina. And that's what I, in a normal lecture, I'd have some lights on the whiteboard, and I'd say, look over here, and you'd see the blue region and the yellow region. And that shows you that it moves with your retina, that it's actually in the cones in your retina that this is happening. Some of the mechanisms are higher up, but this particular one happens there. So that's really what I've been talking about the whole time, color adaptation. But a lot of this spatial vision, image quality, depends on other dimensions. So other things adapt. And there's a, this guy at University of Nevada, Reno, Michael Webster, who's done some really cool adaptation work. And one of the things he's done is on blur. And I saw him demonstrate this a couple years ago. And actually, he did a really neat one. It was during the elections, or just after the elections between Bush and Kerry. So he had an image where he had morphed George W. Bush and John Kerry together. And he had this really weird image of the two of them in between. So imagine morphing the two, and there's this in-between image. And he showed that to everybody. And they're like, do you, you know, do you recognize this guy? And everybody's like, it looks kind of familiar, but no. Because there are features of Bush and features of Kerry. And then what he did, just like what I did with color, is he showed you a picture of George Bush and you fixate it on that for you know, 15, 20 seconds. Then he shows you the morphed image, and it looks just like John Kerry. <laughs> you adapt away all the Bush features, and you see Kerry. It's really amazing. I think it's on his website. It's really striking. And then you do the opposite. You, you adapt to Kerry, you see Bush in the morphed image. So you adapt to have very high-level features. And then he showed blur, which is really cool. And I'll show you that one. Um, same picture. I'm going to blur one and sharpen the other. Nothing magic here. I want you again to fixate in the, not fixate, but just keep your gaze in the little yellow ellipse. And the same thing's going on here. This is what's known as spatial frequency adaptation. It's exactly analogous to chromatic adaptation, but now the wavelengths are spatial frequency instead of light wavelengths. And on the right side, there's no high frequency information. So you're becoming more sensitive to high frequencies or less sensitive to low frequencies. On the left side, there's plenty of high frequencies, and there's actually less low frequencies, relatively. So you're becoming less sensitive to the high frequencies there. This is very well known, goes back many years, as far as you know, looking at sine waves and things. People don't look at it in images so much. But uh, here I'll go back to the, the original images, which were intermediate between these two, and see what you notice. So you see the one on the right looks sharper. 
And that one does, it, it happens at a higher level, so it doesn't move with your retina like the, the chromatic after image quite so much. So you adapt to spatial frequency too. So when Michael showed this in his talk, this was at a, a symposium at the University of Rochester, I'm like, yeah, I go up to him afterwards, like, so Michael, we were studying noise perception in images at that time. You know, looking, noise is just color difference that's spatially distributed across the image, so it's an interesting color difference. And I'm like, does that happen in noise too? And he's like, I have no idea, I never looked at it. So my talk was the next day, so I ran home, popped open Photoshop and said, well, let's put noise in the images. So here's my girls again with some noise added, and you may guess where this is going. Again, fix, or keep your gaze in the little yellow ellipse. On the right, there's lots of noise. It's white noise. Uniform distribution in digital counts. And then a clean image. And I started with one that was somewhere in the middle. So actually, that's the original. So now I'm trying to get you to adapt to noise, but this is different than spatial frequency adaptation because the noise I added has all the spatial frequencies within reason. I mean, obviously there's a limit here, but it has all the spatial frequencies. So if it's just spatial frequency adaptation, you'd expect the contrast to, to go down, but nothing else. And my question was, does the noise actually go away? And now I'm going to go to the original pair, which is intermediate levels of noise. You see that? It goes away really, it's, it's a short-lived effect. It's not as strong as some of these other ones. But it looked less noisy over here. Where you adapt to the noise, you see less of it. And we actually did some psychophysics on this. We could measure the effect, we could model it with ICAM, which was our image model by having the spatial contrast functions adapt to what they saw previously. So it, it, it's really a measurable scientific thing. I can send you details if you're interested. But it's really cool for imaging scientists or imaging engineers who are building systems. Because imagine you're looking at a newspaper, and the images in the newspaper are half-toned with a certain frequency and a certain orientation. If they're black and white, they're 45 degree dots at you know, 100 dots per inch or whatever they do. Um, and every image you see has that same spatial pattern. So you get tired of it. You don't see it so much. If you're looking at a TV with a certain pixel pattern, or in the old days, scan lines, you, you don't see those as much because they're always there. So Michael had a paper called uh, Enhancing, or I forget what it was called, but anyway, Enhancing the Novel Stimulus, essentially, that your visual system is tuned to get rid of the background and see what's new. So you think about watching a TV. You don't want to see the artifacts. They're always there. You want to see you know, the actresses or whatever. So your visual system's doing that. It lets you get away with a lot when you're building the systems. That's why people don't see some of these, these artifacts until you teach them about them, and then it drives them crazy. I used to teach my students about interlace. And, oh, and they hated me after that. It's like, go home and watch TV now. So I'm going to wrap up here, show you that even Yoda cares about color. Um, so the impact of all this is that Color appearance is important, not just chromaticities, contrast ratios, not just those physical things, but what you actually appear can, or what you actually see is, is critically important. And how you use that is important and the impact of the viewing conditions. That's what all of this is about. CCAM 2 I'm not saying that's the answer. That's a tool that helps address some of these things. The, the ICAM stuff we've been working on does some of that. And I'll wrap up. I just want to mention Rod. He's my, my young grad student that's been working with me on a lot of this stuff. He's a Kodak retiree who stumbled into my office one day and said, I'm consulting now and it's getting kind of boring. Can I come get a PhD? Like, you know, he, he helped invent um, the APS photo system. You know, those little cartridges that were really cool until digital came along and blew them away very quickly. You know, he helped invent that system working with Fuji and Nikon and everything. So he knows some stuff and he's a grad student, which is awesome. So he's been doing a lot of the, the work with me and sailing on his boat and having a, a great time. So thanks. I'm happy I went over my time, of course. So that was my 20-minute talk. Um, happy to hang out and answer questions if we have time. I don't know what the, the schedule. Okay. Thanks. Andy, when you uh, increase the dynamic range or the appearance by reducing the white, mm -hmm. you get to a point where the primaries become brighter than the white. Sure. Yeah, and yeah. does it ever start to become the white? No, because they're so saturated. 
there's probably a, a whoops there's probably a point in there where you can get in trouble because you're transitioning from those primaries down to the white but the thing is the only objects in the scene that are going to come up those colors are things like the neon lights any like your shirt is a nice saturated blue it's not going to be up there it's going to come out darker than our diffuse white because that's where it is so that's the key about encoding if i just took your blue shirt and put it up there relative to white it looked like you're wearing neon and that would and then you would start to adapt to it. So the key is to only use it for the right objects. And that's actually part of what Rod is working on to, to wrap up his dissertation, is a really cool algorithm that, that figures out where the things are that are objects and where the things are that are light sources. Not spatially or anything, all based on color. I mean, you can do it with some computer vision. I mean, you guys probably could think of lots, of, you know, all of us could think of a different approach to do that. But just based on the color, so it could be implemented you know, in an ICC profile or something. Find that and then do this sort of thing with the things that are outside the boundary. Push them up to make the neon lights glow, but don't mess with your skin tone, for example, which, as you know well, you don't want the skin tones to be glowing orange. Um, we've been working with Sony on some of this. And Sony introduced a, a wide gamut TV, which had LED, RGB LED backlights. Beautiful TV. We have a prototype in the lab to do the experiments on cost something like ten, twelve thousand dollars and then pretty much all of them got returned because they didn't have a good algorithm for taking the normal content and scaling into the wide gamut. And essentially what was happening is skin tones were glowing orange. And you know the people spending ten, twelve grand on a TV care. <laughs> and they got them back and then you know ended up saying, can you help us a little bit and do some research on the perceptions going on? You know, it's not a secret. I'm not telling you any secrets here. Everybody knows that happened. Um, so that that sort of got us into that area. And there's a couple Actually, there's a couple of talks on that topic. Rod's giving one, and Stacy Casella, who's another of my grad students, on that very topic at the Color Imaging Conference, which is in Portland this year. So, not too far away for you guys. So. Well, it wasn't my decision. Yeah. Yeah. Well, people from Rochester would rather go to the desert, too. Yep. Are there any applications for this technology in print? Um, I'm trying to think of how I might do this because clearly you don't have the light source control yeah. and adaptation. There could be. Um, people have tried in the past to manipulate the adaptation on a print, sort of the same thing. And one of the ones I remember, um, it goes back to Tektronix, and that division is now part of Xerox. One of the, it was probably one of the first color inkjet printers that was color managed, right? It was calibrated. It was before there was any ICC or any of this. And the default, and back then we all had CRTs. The white point of the CRT was 9300 Kelvin, so very blue. You probably remember these blue CRTs. Well, some of you do. Some of you are too young to remember CRTs, probably. Um, <laughs> I'm just feeling old. So the, 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 the calibrated print mode actually sprayed cyan ink on the paper to make the paper the same color chromaticity-wise under D50 or whatever the standard lumen was, probably D50, they shifted it to D93 and then printed. So it had this blue boundary. And, but you take a print and you look at it with everything else. So you weren't adapting to the print. If you viewed it all alone in a dark surround, it would look just like the display. But when you carry it around, it looked like a cyan print, which was horrible. Because you, you can't do that with a print. You have the whole environment. But there are some tricks. I just learned this one from one of my students who worked in Hollywood for a little while. Um, movie posters, some of them are printed two sides. If you're into collecting movie posters, you probably know this. I, I didn't know this till a couple months ago. That you, can, you can go onto the like, movieposters.com, you can buy them. You can buy two-sided posters. And what they do is they print a low contrast version on the back, reversed, and then the normal print on the front. So under daylight conditions, or when it's normally illuminated, you get to see a normal print. At night, they turn on the lights on the back, and it's just like our high dynamic range display. They have the modulation twice, two sets of ink. And I measured one. I got one. Actually, it was, was Yoda, <laughs> by coincidence. I'm not that big a Yoda fan. Um, and the lightsaber and everything. He was holding his lightsaber. And the change in dynamic range was a factor of four. Of the, the two spots I measured, which weren't white and black, I just measured two spots on it, were 25 to 1. They went to 100 to 1 because of having that extra layer. You can think of it multiplying it together. It's give you, give you that kind of. So there are some things you could do. And then if you were doing that, you might be able to control a little bit more. Is there a hand up somewhere? Nope. Oh. 
So if I understand correctly, your ICANN or its algorithm is a, or at least has an algorithm for doing that, mm -hmm. for displaying HDR images. And images. Yes. Yes. How do you compare the quality of that algorithm to like the work that's been done in graphics communities? Like um, actually, that's what a that's what a sorry. They look a lot more realistic. That, that's what we're trying to do because we're actually trying to model the visual system and some of the ones in the, I'll just say the graphics community, I know a lot of those people, so it, they're not strangers, um, are really just aiming to make pretty pictures. Not that that's a bad thing. You know, a lot of the world, you know, Kodak had a whole company built on pretty pictures and they weren't trying to make them accurate. So we were going for realism and accuracy, which a lot of people don't for whatever reason with, with their HDR rendering. Um, sometimes they're trying for an artistic effect, or sometimes they're just trying to maximize what they can squeeze into a small, small gamut. So we have a bunch of experiments we've done, and we're always criticized, oh, well, you forgot so-and-so's algorithm. It's like, well, we can't do them all. But we have a wide range of algorithms we've tested, and generally for accuracy, it's right there at the top. And for preference, it's close. There, sometimes some other ones are preferred because they're a little higher in contrast or a little more chromatic or something, and people just like that. But when we do the accuracy experiments, it comes out well. Um, the, well, the reason we copied Durand and Dorsey a bit was because that one, in the earlier experiments, was, was pretty much always at the top. So the bilateral filter, um, I, I'd have to dig up the, the ones that were used in the more recent experiments. But, you know, we certainly haven't included everybody's because there's a lot out there and there's more, you know, they, they come out faster than we did the experiments. But there, there's a couple of papers we've done, um, one's just forget which journal, transactions on image processing or something like that is coming out. But if you send me an email, I can, can get you the, the details. So it works pretty well. It's always hard to conclude that it's the best, right? You know, that's that's the, the traditional SIGGRAPH model, right? You, you make your algorithm and you compare it to one other and you look at it and clearly it's better and not necessarily do psychophysics. And that's, when you're building algorithms, it's hard to do psychophysics too. And that's what we try to do, is actually do visual assessments with lots of people. But even then, you know, you could pick different images, like the, the sun, sunrise I thought looked too saturated. That could be true for that algorithm with that particular sunrise image. Maybe it does overdo that one, and there's you know, some improvement that could be made. Yeah? You were saying in like 6 or that area that you didn't like where you were uh... <laughs> yeah, well, Matt and I were just talking about that be before. Um, I, when I'm being a purist, I'd like it to just be a model that you never touch, right? That it does whatever the visual system does, and the output is the output. And my student who did the 06 version wasn't quite as pure as me. So he has a few adjustments, and I don't quite have a good handle on how much that's just, you know, an, like a, a colorfulness knob. Mm -hmm. Um, so I have to look into that a little bit more. Um, wasn't the main thing we were focusing on. It does well, and he, if he was here, he'd probably say it's perfectly realistic. It's what the visual system does, and we'd argue about it. So, <laughs> which is okay. And does he do that on a per image basis, or does he? No, no, no. He he had the settings once for a given display because you invert for a given display. So he doesn't. Um, he, he could tweak those all, a lot of parameters by image and get better results, absolutely, but he wasn't doing that. No, it was one setting. It's just it wasn't like an auto, you know, automatic vision system. Right. Right. Thanks. Thank